Hi, I'm Mark Wybrow and this is the Electronic Cafe, the channel for the lovers of electronic music. And I'm Andy McNabb, so let's get started. So welcome to the latest edition of uh, the Electronic Cafe. Uh, we're going to be looking at the uh, Mark One version of the legendary synth punk band Ultravox. Can't wait to do that. Um, and we're also going to be getting a couple of um, guest reviewers on this. Is something Mark and I think we should be doing because we built this whole show on the premise that we want our viewers and people on our Facebook page to share good music. So we thought, well, instead of just us to um, tell you what's new and hot out there, which we will obviously continue to do, let's ask some of our subscribers and members on our Facebook um, page. So um, we're going to have a couple of uh, guest reviewers um, appearing later on the show, so I really look forward to that. Um, and then something else I just want to drop uh, quickly. So a lot of people say to, say to me, where do you get all your information about music? And a lot of it's just through a labour of love, just, you know, playing through different bits of pieces and, and, and search engines. I kind of find bands that are, that are coming through that I love. But the other thing that helps me is um, this little beauty that I subscribe to called Electronic Sound Magazine. So uh, I know most of the um, subscribers on our show will probably be uh, subscribers. So anyway, if you don't and you want to know what's going on in terms of electronic music, this is brilliant. It's got tons of reviews in it, so you can go and explore some new music, which you, this certainly helps me a lot. So I'll ask Mark to put a, an edit up for the link to where you can subscribe for this if you want to do so. So yeah, really good magazine for those real fans of electronic music. So that's it in terms of update. I say thank you for carrying on subscribing to this show, um, loving all your comments, getting some really good feedback, and um, our Facebook page is growing. So you know, all I can say is just a massive thank you. It just makes what we do so enjoyable and such good fun. And it gives me a chance to wear really stupid t-shirts. So uh, anyway, let's uh, get cracking on to uh, this episode of Electronic Cafe. As we all know, there are two Ultravoxes. One stylized with the exclamation mark at the end, led by John Fox from 1974 to 1979, called Tiger Lily to start with, amongst other things. And another one led by Mid between 1980 and 1986, and the subsequent reformations. We're concentrating here on the John Fox-led Ultravox, which had John Fox on vocals, Warren Can on drums, Chris Cross on bass and synthesizers, Billy Curry on keyboards and electric violin and either Robin Simon or Stevie Shears on guitar. Fox left the band in March 1979 to embark on a solo career and following his departure mid took over as lead singer, guitarist and frontman. Between the two versions of the band mid and keyboardist Billy Curry worked on a studio project called Visage which is another story altogether. After which with the band seemingly over, mid revitalised a new lineup with him on vocals and guitar, Warren Can on drums, Chris Cross on bass and synthesizers, and Billy Curry on keyboards, synthesizers, and electric violin. And mid steered this second version of Ultravox to much commercial success, lasting until 1986 when the group disbanded. Although Billy Curry did continue with the Ultravox name for a while on his own. This is what Gary Newman had to say about it all. This is a band called Ultravox. I got signed as a punk rock, I was in a punk band, and we were sent to the studio to make a first album. And in the studio was a synthesizer in the corner, and that's how I got into electronic music. It was just laying there. And I asked the man if I could borrow it, but I'd never seen a real one before, didn't know what anything did. But anyway, that's how I got into it. And I went away from that studio thinking that I discovered something special. And did something similar to this. I went rummaging through a record store. I was signed to a company called Beggar's Banker, who had record stores. I was rummaging through there shortly after that and discovered this band, who were doing something that I thought I'd just invented. And they were on their third album. So, so much for being ahead of your time. I was years late. So, um, 
when Mark suggested we should maybe look at Ultravox and do it in two parts and look at Mark One, I, I was delighted as an idea for having that as an idea. I think it's um, fantastic. Um, I'm a massive fan of Ultravox, but I'm probably going to create a bit of controversy when I say I probably prefer Mark One to Mark Two. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of Midge and what they did commercially. They were far bigger, but um, I absolutely um, love the early renditional stuff that. Um, Ultravox did to create a massive template um, for the rest of uh, a lot of bands going forward. Um, and I think, you know, on the strength of their live act, um, I think they were so good live that the Island Records signed them in 76. But then the group hadn't finalised their name. <clears throat> in fact, at one point, I think they were called The Damned and realised that there was already a band called that. Uh, and in 76, um, while work, look, look, working on the last, last stages of their uh, debut album, they did some name changes. So believe it or not, John Fox. Um, was called Dennis Lee. Um, obviously changed to John Fox and Chris Allen became Chris Cross. And, um, and in February 1977, Ireland released their debut album, Ultravox. Uh, I think like many other bands that formed Britain's punk and new wave movements, they really drew their inspiration from uh, the art school side of glam rock. So musically, they were heavily influenced by Roxy, the New York Dolls, Bowie, Kraftwerk. As Andy said, the band was formed in April 1974 on the initiative of vocalist and songwriter Dennis Lee a then Royal College of Art student, and the band was originally known as Tiger Lily. Dennis Lee changed his name to John Fox. The band grew out of punk and drew inspiration from art school, Roxy Music, New York Dolls Glam, and Bowie Craftwork and Kraut Rock. The exclamation mark added to their name was a reference to the Kraut Rock band Neu, produced by Connie Plank. Connie Plank being the iconic German producer who produced numerous German bands including Cluster, Neu, Kraftwerk, Can, Daff, as well as producing Brian Eno and the Eurythmics. Connie Plank went on to produce four Ultravox albums, The Systems of Romance by the John Fox version of Ultravox and the Vienna, Rage in Eden and Uvox albums for the Ultravox Mark II. The previous two Fox era albums were produced by Brian Eno and Steve Lillywhite. Their sound developed from punky guitar origins into a prototypical synth-pop and the song Hiroshima Mon Amour from 1977 was one of the first tracks by a British band to feature a drum machine, a Roland Rhythm 77 using preset drum patterns. And actually the debut album was co-produced by Steve Lillywhite and Brian Eno who then went on to do uh, Low with Bowie. Um, so, you know, really prestigious company they um, held for that first album. Um, the sales were disappointing. Um, neither the album um, or the associated with single um, Dangerous River Mesa into the UK charts, which is surprising because if you hear that now, it still sounds brilliant, I think. Um, and also, even then, relations within the band were on an occasionally tenuous footing. Um, Fox declared that he intended um, to live without emotions, a, a sentiment he wrote into the de debut album track, um, I Want to Be a Machine. You hear just from that title alone where Newman was starting to get his inspiration from, right? Um, and then they returned, Ultravox returned in 77 with the punkier Ha Ha Ha. And sales of both the album and its lead single, Rock Rock Were Poor. Um, both again, Fades were registered on the UK charts. Um, rock Rock had like a punk lyric chorus with the words, Come on, let's tangle in the dark, fuck like a dog, bug like a shark. Um, despite this, it still got airplay on Radio 1. Although um, Ha Ha was dominated by, or Ha 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 Ra was dominated by um, guitars and electric violin, the, the final track, Hiroshima Mon Amour, was a prototypical synth pop song. And I think it was one of the first tracks by a British band to feature a drum machine. I think it's a Roland Rhythm 77 with preset patterns, and it had a tenor sax solo played by um, the CC of the band, Gloria Mundi. Um, and I think Hiroshima more and more signalled a new direction for Ultravox. The energy, uh, anger and popular appeal of punk was faded in 78. And the more creative UK punk genre talent sought new direction. So instead of calling themselves British, or sorry, calling themselves British New Wave instead of punk rock um, artists. Um, I think Hiroshima more and more, it still remains a critics and fans favourite from the group's initial period. And they performed it live on the Old Great Whistle Test uh, later in 78. Um, I think it's an iconic track. If you haven't heard it, please check it out. It's, it's amazing. And then their third album in 78 was uh, Systems of Romance, was produced um, uh, by Connie Plank, who also um, the producer of uh, some of the Crawford albums that we know and love. Um, and, um, and it was done in Plank's studio in Germany. Um, musically, the album was massively different from the first two albums, um, bringing synths to the forefront of the group sound and, and, and you know, 
despite praise from some critics, again, the album was a commercial failure. Um, and since none of the albums to date have generated much income, tension started to build within the band, particularly between Billy Curry and Fox, um, and that sort of threatened the van's viability. And Ireland dropped the band on the 31st of December in 78 after an attempt to, to, to market the album in the United States without to generate any sales. Um, and that kind of appeared to be the final nail in the coffin. Um, but the Ultravox themselves undertook a self-financed US tour in 79. And they're splitting off their final gig in San Francisco in March of that year. Um, Fox declared his intention to go solo, which is another um, episode all in itself, which we will do at some point. Um, Simon remained in the US and briefly joined the Futants, an American punk band from New York. Uh, he later returned to England, teamed up with Hal Devoto to replace uh, John McGurk in magazine. Uh, the remaining members made their way back to Britain. Um, as we know, Billy Curry um, had been recruited to uh, work with uh, Gary Newman. Apparently Newman, by all intents and purposes, was initially quite starstruck because he was a massive fan of Ultravox. Fox obviously subsequently signed to uh, Virgin and released the um, legendary um, cult album Metamatic. And, you know, Mark did a review on his album, um, Howl, just recently. Um, yeah, his latest album, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, Newman had been a massive fan of Ultra Rocks. Um, and I luckily saw um, Billy Curry with Newman on that tour of 79. Um, and uh, I think Warren Khan went on to work for Zane Griff. Um, so, you know, they all kind of found different projects after the, the breakup of those three albums. Um, I really love the early Ultravox, and I said, I know I'll get a ton of oppos opposition on this, because uh, I know Mark loves the mid-era of Ultravox, but there, there's an edge and creative flair for me that is he, just far stronger in Mark 1. And, and to this day, John Fox, you know, say reviewed um, Mark reviewed his last album. He's as relevant today as he was back in the late seventies. Um, I'd say check them all out. All three albums are pretty groundbreaking, but I also understand that budgets are tight for a lot of people. So if you want to explore or discover the Mark One version of Ultravox um, and you're on a budget, I'd strongly recommend an album called Three Into One, which is a compilation of uh, all the best tracks from those three out three albums. Definitely worth checking out. Um, say, um, an amazing, um, influential band to this day. The John Fox led Ultravox effectively did three albums as well as two compilation albums. Ultravox released in 1977, Ha 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 also released in 1977, and The Systems of Romance released in 1978. And they did two compilations Three Into One released in 1979, and The Island Years released in 1999. Also, with Ultravox Mark I seemingly over, Midure, Rusty Egan, Billy Curry, Dave Formula, John McGeoch, Barry Adamson, along with new romantic icon and nightclub impresario Steve Strange on vocals, collaborated on a project called Visage, a studio-based band which went on to have huge success in its own right. And following the success of this project, encouraged by Visage drummer and mutual friend Rusty Egan, Billy Curry asked Midure to join Ultravox, a Mark II of the band was formed, with Midjure filling in both the parts left by John Fox and Robin Simon for Ultravox's next album, Vienna and Onwards. I like both versions of Ultravox, but for me, the latter slightly edgy, simply because they were the first band I ever saw live. It was the Rage in Eden tour at Hampshire Odeon in 1981, and I saw them the following year also, again at Hampshire Odeon, on the quartet tour on my birthday when they filmed and recorded the live album Monument. I also met them backstage afterwards that night, but I'll save that story for another time, perhaps when we do the episode on the mid year era Ultravox. If you don't know the first incarnation of Ultravox, you really need to check them out. They are pivotal and influential in the British electronic music movement, although it is often said that those early albums failed to capture Ultravox on stage energy, and it is also said that it was this incarnation of Ultravox that first showed the kind of dangerous and distinctive rhythms that keyboards and synthesizers could create. Gary Newman, called the godfather of electropop, described Ultravox as the single biggest influence and musical inspiration. There's no better endorsement than that, is there? Check them out. Ultravox Mark I with John Fox. My sex is a spark of electro flesh, at least from the tick of time and geared for synchro mesh. My sex is an image lost in faded films, a neon outline on a high rise overspill. My sex. 
Riding out to Echo Beach A million memories in the trees and sands Oh no, how can I ever let them go Hiroshima, Mon Amu Looking out at the white world and the moon And feel the soft exchange Beside me for a moment in the rain A silhouette, a cigarette And a gesture of disdain I felt a dark door open So a sudden ghost come through A spark left from my fingertip And I knew it must be you It's you, the man Who dies every day Shifting things are shifting Through the walls and walls The way the walls are falling So welcome to the Hot Stuff section of Electronic Cafe where Mark and I and now several of our subscribers get to talk about stuff they're loving. Um, I must admit the only downside of that is that uh, Mark's got to keep me under a tighter leash so I can only talk about one album in this particular episode which is um, I find very painful for a big fan of such good music out there right now. Um, but the one I am going to focus on is um, this album called Cynthia by the lovely Nina. Um, so if you don't know, Nina Bolt is a um, German singer-songwriter, she's based in London. Um, she's teamed up with a drummer producer called Laura Fairs, which I think she's known better as L.A. Yo or Lau. They've been going since 2011 actually, um, when she released her first single, Take Me Away, um, and then her debut album, Sleepwalking, was released in 2018. Um, this second long-awaited album, um, is a really good follow-up to Sleepwalking, actually. It's really helping her ascension or rise to be a queen of the synthwave throne. Um, I think the album straight stays pretty true to the kind of synth family feel and that growing collective of artists and fans that are really enjoying um, an 80s synth music revival um, or surge. Um, because I say you shouldn't really call it a revival because it never really went away, did it? Um, but it shows that she, as her as an artist, considerable growth, I think. There's some great collaborators on this, um, and a guy called um, Asilian, who seems to be an integral part of Team Nina. So his production and songwriting are attached to a massive chunk of this album. Um, there's also the introduction of um, legendary writer, producer Ricky Wilde, brother of Kim, obviously son of Marty, uh, who's responsible for some of the best pop tunes from the 80s to the day. And also Nina herself has um, co-wrote on pretty much every track in this album. So it really says to me there's someone who's very much in control of their sound and development. Um, the album closes with a really cool, um, dramatic, cinematic uh, a track called The Distance, which, which what I love about it is unlike the rest of the album, um, it sort of begins as like an, almost like a lullaby and it kind of then morphs into this epic soundscape. Um, which someone like M83 would uh, be really proud of. And I know she's a massive fan of M83. So, yeah, really good album. I think you can get it on Bandcamp. If you're lucky enough or fast enough, you might get it in this really lovely um, neon pink vinyl. Um, I think in summary, this is one of the pop albums of the year. Uh, it shows she's an artist at the peak of her form, and she really is going um, from strength to strength. Um, and I think she's kind of almost pushing the boundaries of uh, and preconceptions of the synthwave pop genre. So, um, yeah, check it out. Um, it's a really nice album um, and shows some really good creativity. So, so that's Nina and uh, Cynthia. Uh, really recommended.
my hot stuff tip is the album Happiness, the debut studio album by the English electronic group The Beloved, released in 1990. The reason that I've chosen this is this week I received the 30 year anniversary remastered version and it sounds incredible. And for those who subscribe to the Electronic Cafe Facebook group will know that I've mentioned this album a couple of times already this week. The Beloved are John Marsh and Steve Waddington and were originally a four-piece new wave indie guitar band formed in 1983 in the style of New Order before they underwent a change of direction in the late 80s to an electronic alternative house duo experiencing chart success inside and outside of the UK. This album features the singles Sweet Harmony, The Sun Rising, Hello and Your Love Takes Me Higher. As a four-piece they were obtaining some success. They were signed to a record label and with a couple of John Peel sessions under their belt. However, following a trip to New York, Marsh and Waddington began to heavily embrace the London club scene and their experiences of the scene revitalised them and made them realise that this was the direction that they wanted the band to be heading in and subsequently they orchestrated a change of direction. You really need to check this album out. I am loving this record all over again and the production is first class. A great job has been done on the remaster. The album at the time received critical acclaim and numerous magazines, Q, Select, NME, The Phase, Mix Mag, ranked the album among the greatest of the year. The album achieved significant success both in and out of the clubs and is probably the perfect come down album after Primal Scream's Screamadelica album. There was also a remix album called Blissed Out which features remixes of the songs from Happiness which followed this album just a few months after. John Marsh later became a respected club DJ holding monthly residences at the Ministry of Sound and Fabric in London between 1994 and 2004. Check this album out. I would argue Happiness is one of the first era-defining albums of the 1990s. Let your Hi Andy, thanks for having me on to do this uh, guest review. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes to cover an artist that I only became aware of a couple of months ago um, and I think everyone should know about him and be listening to his music, a guy called Michael Wright, otherwise known as Brassica and he's been on the scene for just over the last 10 years or so um, and uh, really great artist. He is a producer, a musician, uh, he's branched into the world of uh, DJing as well now and covers a lot of genres from synth to new wave to house to disco to electronic body music and industrial dance. And he's produced a series of EPs uh, and an album which are really difficult to get a hold of and um, I've been under pressure to get this review in on time. I've been waiting for this to arrive which uh, just came uh, yesterday, the Hyatt Zor EP. Uh, there's not many of these left so if you can get them on Civil Music uh, label then go and grab one of those. And also his album that he put out in 2014 called Man is Deaf uh, had to uh, go as far afield as Germany and find a shop there um, that had one of these left. In 2016, he put out a deluxe edition of it called Nature Isn't Mute, Man is Deaf with a few bonus tracks on it. Um, and uh, the one that I got happens to come along with all of those as well. So try and get one of those. If you can't, don't worry, you can still buy and download his music to, uh, to enjoy it. This guy is extraordinary and I wish I had more time to go into a more in-depth uh, review of some of the tracks um, on each of these, uh, these uh, publications that I've, uh, I've got here today. Um, loads of different influences from the world of uh, 70s and 80s classic gaming from Atari and Nintendo uh, and that's carried through to some of the work that he's doing now. So he's about to, uh, well there's about to be a game release called Okinawa Rush and he's written a soundtrack to that. Um, things like the video for one of his tracks, which I'll come on to in a minute, Ballo de Morti, um, features the uh, the spaceship from the old game Asteroids that you may remember as a youngster. Lots of different uh, movie influences, different artists, and it's very subjective, isn't it? I mean, music takes us all to different places, but listening to this guy, I go to movies such as, goodness me, Snatch, Logan's Run, uh, Escape from New York, 
the old TV series Monkey, remember that? Really cool uh, music. Uh, musical influences, Fela Kuti, the African jazz artist, uh, Mike Oldfield, Human League, Pet Shop Boys, Kraftwerk, all, uh, Yazoo, all sorts of different uh, people. Um, and really, you would think that there'll be an awful lot of imitation if someone is that influenced by that number of people. But actually, he makes it all his own. It's just in my mind, it takes me to a number of these different uh, different memories. On this album, there are, well, there's so many great tracks, but I have to bring your attention to one called Ballad de Morti, uh, Dance of the Dead. Uh, I actually emailed this guy and bless him, he got back to me and explained the uh, the lyrical inspiration for this. He used to be in uh, in rock and uh, and hardcore bands when uh, when he was a youngster, and the vocoded vocals on this are basically the uh, chorus to Slayer's track "Dead Man's Skin." He turned over one night next to his Italian girlfriend and decided that that's what he wanted to do. Got her to translate the chorus into Italian, vocoded it, and there we have the lyrical concept for one of the most killer tracks that I've heard in years. Check him out. You won't regret it. Loads of great early stuff uh, on YouTube that uh, you can uh, you can see his early work and some of the other stuff and collaborations that uh, that he's been involved with. You won't regret it. Enjoy it. Here's a clip from Ballad de Morty. Dina Cooper, a member of the Electronic Cafe fan community, and Mark and Andy have invited me to be a guest contributor this episode to share what I've been listening to. I recently found the electropop band Toral, who have been around for about 10 years, but were new to me. Their single, The Savior of Love, from 2016, popped up as I was streaming based on what I was already listening to. This led me to their most recent release, a retrospective album called Teniversia. I really love the majestic soaring sound of Savior of Love, so I was eager to listen to the rest of the tracks. Some of my favorites that I found on the retrospective were the moody and dark all over again, and also the poppy dance track Monday, which has a great video to go along with it. I also found that they did some covers from some favorite alternative bands that I love. They've done Stripped by Depeche Mode, a Night Like This by The Cure, and Mad World by Tears for Fears. I'm still discovering more about their music, and I hope that you will also look them up and check them out too. Thanks for letting me share. Now back to Mark and Andy. So thank you, Greg. Thank you, Undana, for those brilliant reviews. Uh, we'll be reaching out to more of you as time goes by to uh, take part in uh, reviewing some of the hot stuff sections. We hope you enjoyed our look at the Mark One version of Ultravox, my preferred version. Just putting it out there, I know we're going to get a lot of pelters about that, but hey, you know, I'm just being honest, that's my view. Um, and uh, yeah, we really look forward to seeing you on the next edition of uh, the Electronic Cafe. In the meantime, stay safe. Bye-bye. Thanks again for watching the Electronic Cafe and for your continued support. See you next time. Take care.